Namaste. If there are questions, we can take it. Dr. Alok Pandey uh, ended his talk with mantras. That reminded me of what the mother has said, without saying that that is how mantras are created, that it is something that uh, the heart hears and uh, the head translates into words. The source, of course, being the divine. So the divine sends the words, which are heard by the heart, translated by the head. And uh, when you saw Dr. Alok Pandey with the, in the background, the pictures of the mother and Sri Aurobindo, both the pictures being pretty close to his ears, you could have uh, seen that as a physical expression of uh, what was going on. The words were coming from the divine and Dr. Alok Pandey was acting as a completely uninterrupted channel. No blocks created by any doubts and no congestion created by any unnecessary thoughts. He just let those words flow. And that is what gives uh, to every word that he utters and every word that he writes a mantric quality. Now over to questions. Namaste Alokda. Sadar Pranam Jema. I have two questions. Namaste. Yes, Sadar, this is Manan. Yes, I have. Yes, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm certain you would. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, Chaturvedi Badrinath Ji's work on the Mahabharat, there is a chapter on causality where he beautifully examines a few key ideas. He talks about Purushartha, he talks about Devam, and then he talks about a combination of these two. Then he talks about Swabhava, and then he talks about Kala and Kal. And he says that Veda Vyasa, in the final analysis, lays maximum emphasis on Kal. And then in Sri Aurobindo's work, Synthesis of Yoga, the Four Aids, um, um, we see Shastra, Guru, Kal, and Utsaha. So in Sanatan Dharma, we have this concept of soul, and we talk about journey over many lifetimes and an evolving psychic being. But on an everyday basis, how how do we make more consciously, you know, peace with the passage of time uh, in the spirit of all life is yoga, especially with all the churn around us at a global level, right? Uh, much more uncertainty and so on. The second question is, uh, is on Aryan psychological stereotype or what archetype, sorry, sorry, archetype. Uh, Sri Aurobindo lays uh, so much emphasis on recovering the Aryan spirit. And, you know, that resonates quite deeply with people all over the world. So could you explore that a bit and also talk about imbibing the essence in everyday life? Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Manan. First of all, uh, I was fortunate to meet uh, Badri Nadji, but, uh, you know, he was not well, so I had gone to see him. Uh, and I'm aware a little bit about his work, which, of course, is a very well-written work on the Mahabharata, with its own limitations, because he was still in the mental domain. But talking of Kala... So time is what? What is the task given to space? Space is given the task of providing room for the manifestation. Time is given the task of arranging the forces to help the manifestation. Because in this world, you see, when time comes, time comes when instead of one, there is two. Now the play starts because relationship starts and that's how time is born. So even at the micro level or the macro level, every bit of karmic transaction has to be taken account. That's why Kal is the grand accountant. He has to take, absorb all these things and automatically manage and put things in the right place and, uh, you know, um, in the total harmony of things, which is not an easy task. So because we have released many energies in the past, and uh, continue to release many energies which are all on their own curves of fulfillment. Sometimes, let us say, a desire which we wanted and after 20 years, the desire is fulfilled when we no more want it. But it is right there in front of us. What do we do with that? So, time is a play field of forces and it comes originally in Sanat Sujatya. That's how Shirdvindu in one of his works describes that time. So, time is necessary because if you try to cut through it, because... The knot of karma or the energy is not in terms of reward and punishment, but the energies and their play is so much entangled that you have to allow time to disentangle it. Time is an instrument of the Lord. But if we try to force it with impatience, it will cut through it. And when it, I mean, or somebody with that, as they say, with the sword of yoga, 
cut the gordian knot but we have finished again the baby with the bath water so that's why patience is required in this kind of effort some people can do it there are ascetics who close all lines through which time has moved by completely withdrawing from the world but i'm not speaking of that and that's a very if you ask me very frankly if the world is a vanity that's a vain ideal because ultimately you have given a lie to god and lie to creation giving a lie to creation is to give a lie to god so we are not speaking of that but in manifestation time has to come into play so how to deal with this process because it's we don't know how many uh, paths we have started traveling in previous lives and in this life and all of them have to be consummated summited something done etc one is by focusing on the inner story which is going behind the uh, several roles and i put it like this that a uh, you know we see as film actor let i'm giving a little crude example but one which applies very well so we see in one uh, movie he becomes a hero in second he is a, a side hero in third he is a villain and fourth hero is a grand part sector etc but behind all these the actor is not any of these the actor is something else or someone else who is growing through all these changing stories so we have to catch that inner thread this is the only way we can go through this whole process that inner thread is with the psychic being so the first thing in the yoga is to find the psychic being whatever time it takes because then we can connect the inner thread imagine an actor uh, who believes i am really this and when in one of the shots he is he drops dead what happens to him <laughs> he has to remember that no i am not dead he has to get up he has to once again cheer up so that's why the psychic being is important this is the way we can understand the play much better and play consciously so this is the first part and second is we have to have an unflinching faith endurance courage surrender because yes it will take time because there are many many knots and not all of them are bad see that's the interesting part we think the entire karmic knot no they are they all have a meaning there was a person whom we met uh, i mean figuratively in a previous life and had a very nice beautiful relationship developing and it closed abruptly that relationship had a potential to go as far as it could go it will come again in life now you want to cut the knot you can try it in traditional yogas but the better way is to purify the energies of love and keep on connecting them with the divine because otherwise these things will return and return so that's why it is said to try to haste and be impatient is actually to delay the process because that means we'll entangle ourselves more and more and more and more whereas if we try to look at it that well i have to keep on offering everything that comes in my life then the path will become easier and simpler but endurance will be required some things may have started very pleasantly but they have they have to reach a dead end their their consumption is only up to this point you are supposed to take a leap towards the future through one of those time loops or time warps if you want to use modern physics and the other person whose hand you are holding cannot take a leap what do you do in that situation you have to leap because each story is different if you leap with the person he may fall into one of those abysses now these are the complexities in the, that's why yoga takes place in real time you cannot make a uniform rule about everyone whether one goes to an ashram or stays in the world the process will be fundamentally the same so the only way to manage time is by learning to surrender by learning to have trust complete trust in the divine that whatever the appearance he works our errors are one who has made the world is ever its lord he works through the our errors are his steps upon the way he works through the fears vicissitudes of our lives he works through the hard breath of battle and toil he works through our sins our sorrows and our tears whatever the appearance we must bear there comes that secret of time whatever the appearance we must bear his knowledge over rules our nescience whatever the appearance we must bear when nothing we can see but drift and bail a mighty guidance leads us still through all and when we go through that process then at the end is he says a date is fixed in the calendar of the unknown and anniversary of our birth sublime our soul shall justify its checkered walk all shall come near that now is not or far after we have served this great divided world god's bliss and oneness are our in born right so the focus should be only to serve the mother to you know whatever veils are presence that's what we have to remove <coughs> and that veil is inwardly it's not a person it's an attachment within so we keep removing the veil and keep connecting with the mother and then 
time management is i mean time management in that sense is <laughs> cosmic time management is her her issue so we should not get into that and uh, regarding the aryan so is very interesting you you know reminded about the aryan recovered the vedas so he says it very clearly recovered the vedas the upanishads the aryan thought not just in Uh, you know by reading a book the exact words are missing but in life and action you see the problem that took place after a point of time we became pandits you see when you read the stories of uh, who was that um, that person ashtavakra and that you know it does does the round ashtavakra going to his uh, father somebody who had uh, who was a uh, arrogant pandit and an ignorant pandit who knew all the shastras who would uh, who would get a person drowned in the river if he lost in the shastra and sure enough um, astavaksha father i i think i it is astavakra but anyways the point is that his father was also made to drown and then astavakra goes and there is a vad vivad uh, or whatever debate and discussion and finally astavakra wins so as per the norms he has to now drown himself this man and astavakra is kind of forgives him now the whole story i found so absurd i mean this man is doing it to prove a point and he is also trying to avenge his father that's not how brahmagyanis live that's not how a seeker after the divine lives that's what you find in mother and shurbindo that's not what is the true aryan spirit the true aryan spirit is what you see in the ancient uh, in the mahabharata if you want to see the the surrender of arjuna when he faces the battle of life he doesn't flinch or run away he doesn't want to defeat somebody that's the mentality of the anaryan the karna he wants to prove a point i will make sure that in a real contest i am the greatest i am the greatest what is arjuna's bhav you tell me madhav where to shoot and i'll do that shishya steham sadhimam that is the aryan spirit to be surrendered to god and shoot we see also in bhishma bhishma is also an aryan spirit so bhishma knows that truth is on that side 100 bhishmas cannot defeat pandavas because krishna is there yet he wants to fulfill his job he has taken a promise and he must do that and shri krishna knows that bhishma has its place and he is doing what he has to do and therefore he doesn't ask bhishma to convert but he goes to karna and says you are on the wrong track you are being an aryan you have a possibility and what are you doing you are denying it for the sake of a false misplaced virtue i want to be friends and i want to be generous how can friendship generosity or any of the qualities be greater than dharma and truth so in indian thought truth and dharma are greater that is the aryan spirit that anything we may do born homie with friendship and all this doesn't mean that it should be on the basis of adharma dharma is the foundation of creation truth is the foundation of creation satyam eva jayate nanitam it is truth that has built the world and if we deviate from truth in our inner beings to start with if we don't even know why we are doing whatever we are doing motives of actions if we try to give a nice glossy cover you know a lot of people say i am doing karma yoga while they are basically earning money and looking for fame but i am doing karma yoga divine is deceived no way the aryan spirit lives in this spirit that my body is a field for the divine sowing so he is a farmer aryan comes from the word ar which means the sharp blade you can apply it either to the uh, foremost part of the plough that let the divine plough this soil to bring out the plenty from the seed which is divine seed which is within or he is a warrior he slays the darkness inside wherever he sees in one corner he chases it not outside is the easier part <laughs> but what we see outside so this is the aryan spirit to live it not just read the vedas uh, upanishad they are wonderful without a doubt about it but only so that we can live by that spirit it's no point in knowing all the shlokas reciting them wonderfully you know otherwise parrots would go to <laughs> moksha because there are parrots who can be taught you know how to recite the gita it's living that truth one moment of living the gita look at this gita is given in a real battlefield not a hermitage let us face the battle of life how can we learn gita in a hermitage and one word of the gita then is enough that he is the all and at his behest the sun moves the stars move at his behest men live and die at his behest my breath and heart beats as long as he wants they will take this is the aryan spirit 
and not simply the Vedvad, the Pandit. So Sri is pointing toward that because we have lived for long under this uh, you know, process of uh, debate, discussion, wearing a nice dress which looks comfortable to others, feel you are a Pandit. All this is hypocrisy. This is not renunciation. People even so-called renounce outwardly, live with wearing one dress. Why should you do that? Yes, if you are too much, uh, you know, okay, fine, it's a natural, comfortable expression, it's okay. But most often than not, it is a, also becomes a means to show who you are. So Aryan spirit is a large wideness of the soul, which has the courage to face life. He is a courageous person. One thing which is important about an Aryan is courage. And the second is faith. These two things. He has faith in himself, faith in destiny, faith in the divine. If faith and courage are there, and at his core is love. Even when he slays, it's not with hatred. Even when he fights, it's not with enmity. All are deceived, do what the one power dictates. In us too, Krishna seeks for love and joy. In us too, Shiva drinks the bitter cup of life. And at the end he says, my enemies, rivals, downfall is my own disgrace. I look at my enemy and see Krishna's face. This is the Aryan spirit. And it comes only through yoga, and not through reading of books. Reading a book can be a beginning. Very often it's a beginning. But the real thing is to put it into practice. Everything that we read, to read the 700 slokas of the Gita or to read the entire Savitri is easy part. But the difficult part is just to practice one line of Savitri when... Uh, Satyavan sees Savitri What does he say? Now you have come Descend I give myself completely to you Just to practice that one little passage Descend upon earth With thy moon gold feet Enrich earth's floors Upon whose sleepy life Yeah The first question is How can the physical manage to aspire Since it is the mind that thinks Yes, good question how will the physical manage to aspire because it's the mind that thinks? Mind doesn't think. Mind only gives form of thought to all that is happening. That's all that the mind does. It's a power of formation. So, but it's the interesting part is mind is the mediator divinity. It is the link through which we become conscious. Let's say my body is having a discomfort. Now the mind says, oh, I'm having a little pain there. Oh, I'm feeling a sukham here. So mind is the mediator. So the beauty of the mind is it can pick up the physical sensations and adding its own thought formation. Shubindu describes it as a paraclete, take it to the supreme. So uh, what it means practically is that when I do exercise with the mind, I can say, may this ex exercise be not just for bodybuilding, but to make the body supple and fit for your purposes. And uh, as mother said, prayer of the cells of the body in so many ways, the body's um, prayer Body has to be given a form of prayer and the mind can engage into it. Of course, doing work for the mother itself is um, the body's prayer. But it can be given a very concrete form. So mind's purpose is that in human being, man is the neta, man prana sharir neta. And the sign of this will be that, you know, whether it's really happening or not happening is that we will become indifferent to all the things that make the body um, you know, uh, what it will be freed from subjection to all the environmental things, she, toshn, all these, uh, it's very hot, it's very cold, or oh, the AC is not working, all these things will go away. That will be the sign that the physical is getting ready for the uh, divine working. So, this is how the mind has to be brought in. If one is very conscious within the body, a time comes when one is conscious within the body then the body also directly can aspire but the mind helps it it picks up the signals and transduce gives them a thought form it can do it without a thought form so that's how it has to be done and one has to offer every action of the body Shubindu goes on to say even you have our very breathing our activities which are most autonomous for instance excretion even those things have to be offered to the divine. So who will do the offering through thoughts? It is the mind which will give a thought. Otherwise it can be an inner state that all is entering into it. It can be an image, anything. Yeah. That's it. Uh, the next question is, uh, how to find the psychic being? Oh, how to find the psychic being is a big, big <laughs> journey. Uh, I can only give a sutra. It's there on Aroma tube several uh, talks we have had but 
the simplest way is psychic being is right behind the heart center. So to find the psychic being, the simplest way is to go through the heart center, which means devotion, bhakti, surrender, love for the divine. This is the simplest, easiest path. But there are two kinds of bhakti. One is the very surface kind of bhakti, which is happy to jump and dance and uh, sing some nice songs and it remains unchanged, where emotions are not given to the divine. There is only an external bhakti where one goes, does this, what is called as matha tekna, you know, <laughs> peripona, <laughs> touch and <laughs> forget about it. That is not bhakti or bhakti which is hatuki bhakti, that I want this, I want that. Now this is a vital bhakti, it doesn't lead us very far. One day it can open the door because after asking things from the divine, one, may, one day we may say, who is this fellow who is granting me things? <laughs> I want him, this guy who is sitting out there in the heart. But the real bhakti is the very quiet, silent, it, it is a bhakti where we give ourselves to the divine. And, and there is a joy in giving, not giving, okay, I am giving in the, to the divine, maybe in one year time I will have the supramental realization. That's again a condition. Psychic bhakti makes no reservations, it's an unconditional bhakti. So basically the best way to find the psychic being is through bhakti, love, surrender, unconditionally. Without what the divine will give me, no. He may even take away whatever I called as minds. Look at the life of Mira. Look at Shurabindo when he says, I know God will help, but he has contracted a bad habit of helping at the last time. And there is a joy in that. It's a joy of the play. So till then one has to become ready. Not that one can feign this state. But um, bhakti, surrender, love is the best and shortest way. And at the same time, concentration in the heart. Having this will for the discovery. And that means not be tied to the ephemeral outer personality. I am this, I am that. I have a big biodata card. No, that's irrelevant. I am that soul which is eternal within. To always to remember it and to keep focusing on that. Yes, in short. Yeah. To love the mother. Shortest. Yeah. Or at least to love. <laughs> love truly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, the next question is on similar lines. Uh, being in the world and devoting to divine is much more difficult than giving up everything and move away from the world for self-devotion. How does one start her journey of self-devotion in the world with all sorts of lures? So it works both ways. Living in the world and giving ourselves to the divine and renouncing the world. It works both ways actually. So there is a recompense. Yes, uh, doing it while being in the world is more difficult initially. But very soon one enters a very wide grand trunk road. Because then it doesn't matter. Any activity can become a means for the communion and the union. Besides also because our nature through the works and through meeting you know, people, meeting means because in work you are bound to meet situations and circumstances and people most of all. So, they make our nature more supple and ready to receive the divine. Whereas if we do an exclusive concentration, initially it is easy. But after a point, the path gets blocked. It becomes very difficult to cut through. One has to be then like a Mira. That renunciation is not just a simple renunciation. That I just move out of my family into an ashram and do it. No. Then it has to be, even people go to ashram and they get attached to everything there. To the little comforts of life. Even there, there is the senior Swamiji and the, you know, more advanced sadhak and the less advanced sadhak. So that, that renunciation where there is an exclusive concentration is not easy beyond a point. Initially it's easy. One leaves the worldly things. But after that, there is a tremendous struggle. Whereas if one proceeds through the world and gets prepared... And that's why in Shurabindu Ashram, both Pondicherry and Delhi, I'm sure, you can't renounce the world the way, <laughs> the way <laughs> one renounces it outside. Because that's the path. So, if we are engaged in the world, it's difficult in the beginning, no doubt. But if one practices the all-inclusive uh, concentration, then after a while one enters the grand trunk road and the gadi goes very fast. Whereas the other way is initially looks like a g big road, and uh, or a narrow road but no traffic but very soon you hit road blocks it's like ascending a mountain where you start with a little path and afterwards it's breathtaking so it depends on the temperament I suppose but in Shobindu Yoga it has to be the all inclusive concentration through the world that's why in the third chapter of the mother it is to walk through life so anyways in Shobindu Yoga it has to be through life now of course um, 
not, as I said in the beginning, not engaging with the world in the ignorant way, but yet not to cut life, but to walk through life. So we have anyways no choice, so, <laughs> because we have taken this yoga. Even in ashram, the world will be there, very much. So, <laughs> yes. It's a question of being focused on the goal. It doesn't matter. One may be in the forest and yet like Jad Bharat, you know, worried about animals, worried about Pariyavaran and all that. Nothing wrong with Pariyavaran worrying. And one may be in the midst of the world, yet like a lotus leaf uh, connected within. So that's a question of the intensity with which we are, we are seeking the divine. If he becomes the reason of our existence, then it doesn't matter where we live. <laughs>